Many reasons for the present climate emergency. Um, my name is Peter Carter, I'm director of the Climate Emergency Institute. This is my colleague Paul Beckwith. And we um, are going to start by just showing you the situation in Africa. Africa is in a multi year drought, a vast region of southern Africa, as you see. Um, the image on the left is a reservoir, a water reservoir, which is completely drained. Today we have an estimated 45 million people in Africa threatened with loss of their food security. This is a climate change emergency. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, we are also um, uh, uh, going to have uh, Regina Valdez, um, who is actually going to explain the root cause of what we are doing to the planet and the solution. Okay, so Paul back with uh, from Ottawa. The WMO State of the Climate 2019 report that was just recently out says that we have 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming since the 19th century. 2.5 Celsius in the Arctic, half a degree over the oceans, the sea surface temperature. Uh, and a few degrees over land is also higher at higher elevations. The problem is, is the baseline for that 1.1 degrees Celsius is 19th century. Problem, devil is in the details. Go back and look at the baseline for the initial 2 degrees Celsius uh, temperature and safe, safe zone. When that 2 degrees came up, it was based on the pre-industrial uh, temperature pre-industrial meaning 1750. So the baseline has shifted and that lowers the warming to 1.1. If we use the original baseline of 1750 and compare it to the 19th century baseline, there's plus 0 0.3 degrees Celsius of warming. So that 1.1 degree of warming globally in the WMO report should actually be 1.4 degrees if you compare it to the 2 degrees Celsius or even the 1.5 degree <coughs> aspirational temperature. Thus, this year our temperature was 1.1 plus 0.3 or 1.4 degrees above pre-industrial. So that's the number we should be comparing to reaching 1.5 or 2, not 1.1. So it's a lot worse than you think. Why did this baseline shift occur? Who, who put it in there? Why isn't it being recognized? So it's worse than we think. Now, I want to give one little metaphor. There was a very funny British comedy in 1975 called Monty Python and the Holy Grail. There's a famous battle in there where the knight, the valiant knight is fighting the bad guy. And they're fighting over crossing a bridge or something and the knight chops off one of his arms. And he says, ah, a mere flesh wound. The, the, the bad knight says, a mere, a mere flesh wound. And he continues battling, holding his sword in his one hand. Then his other hand gets chopped off, so he starts kicking the guy instead. One leg gets chopped off and then the other leg and he's on the ground and, he's, and he's, he goes to try to bite the knight. Like he won't give up. He doesn't recognize the seriousness of the situation. Um, and I say that we're a bit like the bad guy because we're having serious events around the world and we're not recognizing that we're having all of these serious events. It's like death by a thousand cuts. So it's not enough pain yet, at least for politicians and, and many governments. Scientific reticence has not helped. Google climate change faster than expected, you get a huge number of hits. Google slower than expected or as expected, and you get very little. The science on climate change, the consensus report, 
works has always been strongly biased to downplaying the problem, to understating it. The Earth's climate system is a heat engine. Two-thirds of the heat moves from the equator to the pole via the atmosphere, one-third in the oceans. The problem is, is that the ununiform heating with latitude is causing a huge problem because as the poles, especially the Arctic, um, loses sea ice, that's dropping at about 12.9% per decade in September. Uh, spring snow cover dropping 22% per decade. So the Arctic is getting to be a darker, literally a darker place. 52% of the light coming in from the sun in the summer was reflected 30 years ago, and now that number is only 48%, according to NASA satellite monitors. So a darker Arctic absorbs more sunlight, so it melts faster and faster. This is a vicious albedo feedback, which causes Arctic temperature amplification. Now, the ice in the Arctic keeps the Arctic cold, because the temperature above ice is just slightly above zero. As you lose the ice, then the, all that heat that goes into melting ice is no longer going into melting ice, it's going up into heating the water. So if you take an amount of energy that melts a kilogram of ice, apply it to water at just above freezing temperature, the temperature will rise 80 degrees Celsius. In other words, when there's no ice in the Arctic Ocean, so-called blue ocean event, it, temperature, the, the temperature in the Arctic will skyrocket. Uh, how close are we to an Arctic blue ocean event? Many people are arguing we're within five to ten years. What happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. I should have copyrighted that phrase. I first used it ten years ago. You probably heard it, you know, being mentioned by many people. The jet streams exist physically because the pole is cold and the, Ar and the equator is warm. As the Arctic warms, you lower the temperature gradient, the jet stream slows down and becomes wavier and becomes stuck. You get very, very deep troughs, you get very, very high ridges in the high ridges, you get heat waves and drought in the troughs, you get, uh, you get uh, rain events, torrential rain events leading to, to flooding. The ridges have gone as high, up as high north as the Arctic, in the middle of the winter, bringing above zero temperatures there, in the middle, in the darkness, in the middle of the winter, and the troughs have gone down and even crossed the equator. So because we, we get these persistent stuck weather events, so extreme weather events increase in frequency, severity, and duration, plus they happen in new places. Snowstorms in dry deserts, floods in places that never had floods before. This is taking a huge toll on human lives, on infrastructure, on, on cities. Uh, we live in a climate casino, basically. If your city locks out of the climate casino, then it's trashed. Hurricane Stall. Hurricane Harvey installed over Texas because the jet streams had, had, had uh, basically petered out and it dumped five feet of rain. Um, and more recently, Category 5 Dorian stalled and did not move. It sat over Grand Bahama and Abaco Islands for two full days, destroying just about everything underneath. So abrupt climate system change is occurring. It's highly nonlinear. There's many tipping points. We have to be wary that we're not crossing these uh, points. And I'll uh, finish up in just a moment here. Um, so we're in a climate emergency. We have to slash fossil fuel emissions as soon as possible. We have to deploy carbon dioxide removal techniques and solar radiation management techniques to try to keep the Arctic at a cold place. And if we don't do that, um, you know, clearly when we lose all the Arctic sea ice, Greenland melt rates are going to skyrocket. Methane's coming up from permafrost and tundra. And, um, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a world of, of grief. I mean, especially if methane comes up. You know, uh, Peter Wadden's looked at 50 gigaton pulses of methane coming up in the Arctic. There's only 5 gigatons of methane in the atmosphere right now, so that would increase methane levels very quickly to a factor of 10 times higher. And shooting off we go to, uh, you know, very, a world where it's very, very difficult for, for human agency to, to, to do anything. So the big thing that's going to hit us soon is with these messed up jet streams, how do we grow food, right? We're gonna have global food shortages. We're gonna have a dystopian world. The, the last human feedback that I just wanna mention is that as 
as, as all this uh, stuff is happening, countries turn inward, they build borders around their countries, they cut back immigration, eventually they'll get rid of all immigration, and they just try to survive within their confine of the country. So for Canada, the trick is to get the U.S. to build a wall at the Canadian-U.S. Uh, border and have the U.S. pay for it, and uh, then that'll keep hordes of Americans coming up into Canada when the Southwest becomes an uninhabitable place. Okay, so, so I'll pass you over to, to Peter now. Probably you exceeded my time. Thank you, Paul. Um, Paul, stop me when um, there's five minutes left for Regina, please. Just, yeah. just stop, okay? So, uh, uh, going back to the slide of Africa, many people have said that you're looking at a picture of economic genocide, right? The reason for that is we have known for decades, the science has projected, predicted for decades, that Southern Africa would be is one of the most climate change drought vulnerable regions in the world. So, um, uh, who is the climate emergency for? All of the world's children today. All of them. They will be all substantially impacted by the uh, effects, many, many effects that I'm going to go through just as a list. And uh, that comes from the Lancet Medical Journal published November 2019. So I'm going to just go fast through the climate emergency reasons and responses. We have a 2020 scientific determined definite deadline for emissions to decline. Okay to say they're not going to decline in 2020, but we have always known for over 10 years that 2020 is the absolute limit, the deadline for global emissions to decline. So that is one thing that the Climate Emergency Institute is very much focused on today. So here's the list. The sixth extinction is ongoing and accelerating. Global carbon emissions are still increasing. We have accelerating atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. We have accelerating ocean disruption, ocean heating, ocean disruption, uh, ocean heating, ocean deoxygenation, and ocean acidification. Everybody knows that extreme weather events are increasing in all regions. There are the multiple impacts of agriculture, which we have known for a long, long time. The IPCC 2018 climate change land report said that we are already being impacted by reduction of world food security by global climate change, and this will increase. Food is the bottom line for all of us, right? The Arctic, as uh, Paul Beckwith has already mentioned, the Arctic carbon sink has switched to a source. That is a dire, dire emergency. And then there are feedbacks and there are tipping points, hothouse earth, runaway climate change, superheating, Arctic sea ice and West Antarctic ice sheet have already passed their tipping points. Dr. Hansen warned about that 10 years ago on the Arctic sea ice passing its tipping point. Others other systems, planetary systems, are close or past, possibly, their tipping points. So, a great paper published just this year by Tim Lenton and others, published in the Journal of Nature, said to avoid tipping points, emissions must decline on an immediate basis. That is the science. Okay, so I'm just going to drift through these. 2019 global emissions increased. They are predicted to be, uh, to be the highest on record. So we had 2017 increased carbon emissions, 2018 increased carbon emissions. This year is going to be another increase and it's going to be amongst the highest increases on record. Climate change threatens the survival of the human race and most life. A quote by our excellent Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, climate change is an existential threat to most life on the planet, including and especially humankind. 
global warming is accelerating. There are lots of papers pointing out that global warming is accelerating. That's the global surface increase that was published by the WMO, 1.1 degrees C. And if you look at that map in the Northern Hemisphere, you see climate chaos.